al doctor Jami Rashid, quien va a compartir escenario con el doctor Adrián Sen y exposición con el doctor Efraín González de Olarte, quien participará de forma remota. El doctor Hamid Rashid realizará su presentación en inglés y presentará la conferencia The World Economy in Turbulence, a soft landing or a crash. Hamid Rashid, as chief of Global Economic Monitoring Branch, leads the writing team for the World Economic Situation and Prospects previously. He served, fue a senior in, uh, fue un, bueno, no voy a leer en inglés porque tengo He was senior interregional advisor for macroeconomic policy in UN visa, advising finance, central banks, and planning authorities in developed countries on how to design and implement policies to manage short-term economic shocks and realize the long-term goals of equitable growth and sustainable development. Prior to joining Andesa in 2010, Hamid served as a senior advisor in UNDPS. Bureau for Development Policy, and also as the Director General for Multilateral Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bangladesh. He earned his PhD in Finance and Economics from Columbia University in New York, working under his advisor and mentor, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Hamid also obtained a Master in Economics and an MPA from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Texas. His research interests include macroeconomic policies, international finance, financial market liberalization, and their impact on economic growth and development. Para comentar la conferencia del de Dr. Rashid, van a estar Carlos Adrián Sen, es nuestro decano de la Facultad de Economía, es economista, tiene un doctorado en Administración y Negocios Internacionales de la Universidad de Cataluña en España, tiene estudios de doctorado de, eh, en, economi en Economía y Negocios en las universidades de Boston, Quebec, Harvard y Pittsburgh. Profesionalmente ha trabajado como profesor y como autoridad académica en diferentes universidades del país y del extranjero y también es un reconocido consultor internacional por, para asuntos económicos y financieros. Ha sido eh, director de estudios en, y es, está, estoy leyendo en inglés y estoy traduciendo en español, parece que se me complica, perdón. Ha sido director de estudios y estadísticos en la oficina de la SBS, vicepresidente de Indecopi, Um, y principal este, consultor de diferentes ministerios de Economía y Finanzas y Agricultura, entre otras posiciones. Tiene un Senior Executive, Executive Fellow de la John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University y ha recibido el premio Hipólito, Hipólito en, en la UNANUE por el mérito económico y financiero eh, otorgado por el Ministerio de Economía y Finanzas. El doctor Efraín Olarte, que nos va a acompañar, de, González de Olarte, perdón, que nos va a acompañar de manera remota, es economista, máster de la Universidad Católica de Lovaina y tiene un doctorado en Economía del Desarrollo en la Universidad de París. Es doctor honoris causa de la Universidad Nacional de San Agustín de Arequipa, profesor honorario de la Universidad Nacional de Huamanga. Es profesor de de 1979 y eh, ha sido director académico y jefe del Departamento de Economía de la Universidad Católica eh, de la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Es profesor e investigador en diferentes universidades alrededor del mundo. Es, especial, es especialista y consejero internacional en economías en desarrollo, desarrollo humano y economías regionales. Autor y editor de 25 libros y más de 150 artículos académicos. Ha sido director general del de Instituto de Estudios Peruanos y presidente del directorio de Electro Sureste, además de director ejecutivo de COPE. Bienvenidos a todos. Welcome. If you can please join us here for the dissertation. 
Y ahora, Michael, para ver la presentación. Ya la vi, ya la vi, ya la vi. No, no, no sé. ¿La presentación? Sí, lo veo aquí. Eh, no la vamos a ver, acá la tenemos que ver. Ah, pero yo voy como a poner. Eh, ¿No va a venir acá a exponer? Sí. ¿Sí? ¿Con esto puede ir pasando? Ah, sí. ¿Mm? Sí. 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 Ah. If you can. Yeah. But it's not showing in the, in the computer. Oh, that so, I need to see it. No, it doesn't show. I can okay, open I, it. I can look at my laptop there. No. I, I can open yeah. here another tab. Yeah, yeah. Please. So you can. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you use it here with the mouse uh -huh. yeah. and then pick the yeah. with, with okay. the uh -huh. right. okay. okay. here in here and okay. you can move it with your okay thank you uh good afternoon colleagues and and thank you so much for inviting me here it's my pleasure to um, make a presentation and from my title you may guess that i may not carry a lot of good news for the world economy but uh i'll try to be you know, optimistic, but it's hard at this time. Uh, and this would be basically a, a long journey through the global economy and global macroeconomy. So please bear with me. I uh, digress a little bit, uh, but uh, at the end, everything will fall, uh, fall together. So what we are seeing right now Not clicking anywhere. Okay. Yeah. I need to click here in order to pass the. Oh, I have to go back and forth? Yes. Oh, that's, that's a, a little bit of an issue. Yeah. Okay. So we are in a very difficult time in the global economy, and there are many factors that, that are shaping uh, the, the current economic uh, trends. And if you look at it, there are five or six factors that I've outlined here. And some of them are very known, but I'll not spend a lot of time about the first few factors. I'll come back to them later on. But as you know that, you know, the COVID is still with us. And as I can see it in Lima, at least, you know, uh, that uh, COVID is a reality. And, and this has offended the global economy, uh, shocked the global economy uh, in an unprecedented way. And obviously, in the backdrop of that, while we're recovering from COVID, we have new geopolitical tensions that, that emerged, namely the war in Ukraine. That has been a, an additional shock to the global economy and has caused significant turmoils on both on the supply side, but now also on the demand side. And I'll, I'll again come back to that. And the third factor that is has been actually uh, brewing for a while, the great rupture. I call it a great rupture or decoupling of the two largest economies. Uh, for the first time in history, the two largest economies were had a symbiotic relationship. Uh, they were mutually dependent. Uh, China's growth came from the US demanding uh, a lot of Chinese goods and services. But this relationship is now coming to a sort of a, a different trajectory and probably will see a significant reversal. And fourth point, it is very important for us to look at that over the last 15 years or so, since the global financial crisis, we're seeing a great disconnect between what happens in the financial market and what happens in the real economy. After the global financial crisis in 2008-9, and uh, there was a massive injection of liquidity in the US uh, under this initiative called QE, quantitative easing, basically a fancy term for central bank buying government securities so that interest rates remain very low, with the objective that low interest rates would encourage a lot of investments in the economy and the economy would grow very fast. The first part of the of expectation definitely realized we had a lot of liquidity in the US economy and in, by extension in the global economy, but investment didn't pick up and growth on average in the US post the global financial crisis actually was almost a percentage point lower than the before the global financial crisis. So, QE only did one part of it, but the other part of it is that QE in the US and rest of the world created a massive asset price inflation. 
you saw the stock market is doing significantly well when the rest of the economy was doing very poorly. And that disconnect is true even today. And in, the, in fact, it has been reinforced since the global pandemic. Uh, since the COVID crisis, and you see a massive disconnect between what happens in the Wall Street stock markets and what happens in the real economy in terms of job growth, in terms of poverty reduction, in terms of you know, uh, you know, wage growth, all of this, there's almost a two separate realities in the world. The last two factors that I want to uh, highlight here is the issues of productivity uh, growth in the US and in the world economy. In the before the global financial crisis, there was a massive productivity boom, mostly driven by technological changes in the in, in the you know the so-called internet revolution, and then uh, you had an extension of that, and that was driving economic growth. Uh, technological change is the main driver of economic growth, and since the global financial crisis, we saw a slowdown in productivity growth in the U.S. and also in the rest of the world. But this is becoming even more entrenched post-COVID. Part of that change is driven by changes in preferences, the way people work, the way we organize ourselves, the business structures, they're all shifting significantly. And so, and that is affecting productivity growth. As you know, as students of macroeconomics, um, um, I see a lot of students here, that long-term economic growth comes from technological change and productivity growth is a key driver. That is slowing down globally, but mostly in the two largest economies, the US and China. China's uh, slowdown is even more uh, significant because China's productivity growth largely came from very strong trade and investment relationship with the US and with the West. Uh, there was a lot of technology transfer from, from, from the developed countries to China that is slowing down and that will affect productivity growth in China and China's economic growth in the, in the future. The last factor that is shaping the current policy discourse is the inflation. In the U.S., inflation reached about nine nine and a half percent in July, uh, uh, in the end of June. In Latin America, nine percent inflation is nothing. Nobody cares about nine percent inflation. But the U.S., after living a decade with no inflation, most of the times economists were asking, "Where is inflation?" We had no inflation for almost a decade, and then nine percent inflation became a huge shock. And that is creating a lot of policy dilemma right now. What can policymakers do? Because in one hand, recovery is very fragile right now. And if you want to fight inflation you know, uh, front and center, the most typical response is to raise interest rates, meaning that raising the cost of uh, funds and cost of borrowing, and that will slow down economic growth. That means we may actually slide back. And that is the challenge, uh, policy challenge, and developing countries face additional challenges in terms of their exchange rate uh, taking a hit, and capital outflow is becoming more entrenched right now because as US interest rate goes up and the developing countries also need to raise interest rates, that becomes their growth more susceptible. And overall, uh, the net effect of that is that you see massive outflow of capital from develop developing countries back to the developed countries. And this is again a challenge that needs to be addressed head on, but what are the options? right now without having a crash landing. And this is what we, we, are, we are trying to avoid here. We don't want a, a global economic recession uh, because that would be too costly. Uh, so how do I go to the next slide? Just, okay, so I'll just use this. So we, for my job, my, my primary role is that we do economic forecasting. So we do short-term forecast for the two-year horizon. And we had that significant downward revision of our forecast. Early on uh, in January, we thought global economy would grow by 4% this year. Now we have done, by May, we reduced it to 3.1%. And this is going to be even further downward re uh, uh, revision. Uh, in, in the worst case scenario, the IMF just in July last month, they came up with forecast that you can have it about global economy may grow, uh, you know, 2.6% in uh, 2022. And there'll be no recovery in 2023, meaning that growth in 2023 would be lower than the growth that we are having right now. If you ask me in 2021, a lot of us were expecting a robust growth in 2022 and further growth in 2023, building on the growth that we had in 2021. But let's not fool ourselves. In 2021, growth was basically statistical growth. We had a massive 
suppression of demand all over the world. And all of a sudden you reopen the economies and demand surged back, spending went up and we saw economic growth. But that was a statistical adjustment. We didn't have real rec economic recovery in that sense because global output is still below the output that we could have if there was no COVID. So in that sense, we're still recovering from, from the COVID shock. And one thing is that the two largest economies in the US and China together, they account for 45% of global uh, economy and more than 50% of global growth. China's growth has slowed down significantly. And that is a concern that, that should keep you awake because China's growth matters a lot for Latin American countries. If China slows down significantly, that would have adverse effect on the Latin American economies and the recovery path. And sorry to say this, the worst is not behind us, it's ahead of us. The global economy is facing significant challenges uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, uh, in the next uh, um, couple of years. So now we're stuck again. Oh, I probably went too far. Okay, here. So it's not changing there. So I talked about the inflation. Inflation outlook is equally uh, ominous. If you look at the global inflation uh, during the last um, decade, we had very low inflation averaging about, uh, I would say, uh, about, uh, this is the, if you say about 3% um, globally, but now it's twice as much. And in Latin American countries, inflation reached about uh, close to 15%, projected inflation. So that inflation, uh, uh, impact of inflation is already felt in advanced economies, but also in developing countries. And that is some, uh, a factor that uh, would drive the policy choices uh, because inflation uh, you know, is a drag on global uh, economic growth and we have to address it, but at what price we should pay to, to bring inflation down to a moderate level. In the US, inflation target is 2%. This is an, artificially uh, determined target, why we have to have 2% target. There's no economic theory behind it, but central banks have chosen that 2% inflation target is, is good. Uh, but even to go down to 4% inflation in the US, there'll be significant adjustments, significant uh, cuts in uh, aggregate demand. And that would may lead the economy, US economy towards a recession. Uh, someone asked me uh, uh, during the coffee uh, break that whether US is in inflation, uh, is in recession. Technically, as part of the definition, yes, US economy is in recession, but, but if you ask people and that other definition that is used in the US, several months of negative growth and several months is not defined exactly. Uh, NBER, the main body that, uh, that declares recession in the US, they haven't officially called the US economy in recession as yet, but it is technically in recession. Can I change uh, slides here? If you can help me because I can't see the there very well okay uh i'm going to do another thing just let me use it a minute so yeah, i can sure. technology is always uh, a challenge uh you know while we have some benefits but also we are here right uh, yeah, here. Slide? yeah yeah okay I, I want to go to the next slide yeah let me change just i'm going to duplicate so we can Again. Here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. It will change simultaneously. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, so now the rest of my presentation will be focusing on the developing countries, but especially on Latin American economies and uh, what, what we see uh, in, the, in the short term horizon. Uh, the growth in developing countries, of course, averaged uh, higher than the growth that we had in advanced economies. But, but again, there also we see some, some revision downward revisions of growth. You know, we expect um, developing countries as a group uh, to go by 4%, but again, subject to a lot of downside risks. And inflation, I said, uh, Latin America is having double-digit inflation. Almost all the regions, uh, developing regions, except for East Asia, 
are having high inflation. And this is, again, a, a great significant departure from what we ex experienced in the previous decade before COVID. So, and that is uh, putting policymakers in a very tight uh, spot, how to respond when the recovery is still very fragile. And as we know, war in Ukraine is putting additional pressure on food prices, which is a, one of the main drivers of uh, uh, in inflation. And, and uh, especially in Africa and food insecurity is rising and, and it's, it's a challenge. Along with inflation, what is happening with the rising uh, interest rates in the US, it's driving up the borrowing costs for the developing countries. Developing countries uh, to meet their, uh, both the trade and fiscal deficits, they borrow externally or other mechanisms, and the cost of borrowing is going up. And debt servicing cost is going up too. So almost all the developing countries, you know, the 60% of the developing countries are facing debt distress or high level of debt distress, meaning that they are in a fiscal squeeze where the choices are very limited, unlike the US or advanced economies, where they can spend and spend and spend without fearing too much about its negative consequences. Developing countries don't have that option of uh, running huge deficits at this stage uh, and, and not worry about inflation. So they have additional constraints they have to deal with and the debt servicing burdens are uh, putting additional uh, uh, stress. So the question that we have here is that, are we, you know, many of you are aware Latin America had a bad decade in the eighties. Are we seeing a repeat of the last decade. The last decade of the 80s was a, a decade where Latin America entered a phase of very low growth, high inflation, and on the backdrop of a very high level of external debt. And this is where you see that the level of debt, this is a nominal debt, but still I'll, I'll show the scaling effect later on, but the debt level skyrocketed uh, in the last, uh, um, uh, I would say since global financial crisis. And bear in mind, this was, not just a demand-driven increase in debt. There was a supply-side pressure. With a very low interest rates in the US uh, post uh, global financial crisis, there's a huge pressure among the US financial uh, uh, intermediaries to channel resources to de advanced developing countries and, and emerging markets. So you see a massive increase in, in, in debt uh, in post GFC. And that is what we are dealing with right now in terms of very high level of debt. And that was, partly demand driven in the developing countries, but also supply side pressure, pressures were there. And if you look at debt service payment as, as share of GDP, this is where I think we need to look at that because debt to GDP ratio is comparing apples and oranges. Debt is a stock, GDP is a flow. So the measure that I look at is the debt service to GDP uh, or debt service to government revenue. And both have increased significantly and we're not too far off from the levels that we had in the 1980s. So that means that debt service burden, uh, not debt stock burden, debt servicing burden are almost similar to what we had in the 80s in Latin America and uh, some of the major economies, the five largest economies, that is the trend. But this is probably the big beginning of a bigger crisis because still interest rates are very low and rollover risks are very low, meaning that you have current debt that is mature and you can take new debt to retire the old debt, but not at a very exorbitant interest rates. But if interest rates keep rising, the debt servicing cost would exponentially rise. And very quickly, countries can you know, fall into a debt distress, further debt distress or debt default. So this is a, a scenario where we saw already unfolding in a number of developing countries. In Latin America, a number of countries, including Argentina, uh, in, during COVID time, faced that, that uh, default. Suriname faced that default. Other countries also either in default or restructuring their debt, but across the world, that risk of debt default is rising. And this is again debt to GDP ratio. If you look at the, what happened in the 1980s versus uh, uh, a debt to GDP ratio uh, in, the, in the last five years, and you see it for largest economies in, in this region, uh, the ratio is higher right now than it was in the 80s. But still, we are not seeing a debt crisis as yet, except for Argentina, uh, is partly because interest rates are still very low, historically low, because in the 80s, interest rates went up to 
but now we are still at, 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 at a very uh, low rate. You know, US Fed funds rate are not even 3% yet, but if rates go up, then we would definitely face a significant uh, challenge there. So this is, I don't want to go through all the lines here, but the idea is that you see quite a bit of similarities between what happened in the 80s, uh, what we are facing right now. And one uh, you know, first idea is that you know, there's a massive increase in the borrowing in the 70s. And same thing we saw, massive increase in external borrowing in the, in, in the last 10 years or so uh, in this region. And oil price had a huge uh, uh, increase in, in, in 1980, uh, riding on, on the oil shocks in 1979. And we also see a similar oil shock right now, massive increase in oil prices. Uh, Fed funds rate, uh, increased from 11% to 20% in one year time in 19, uh, between 1979 and 80. Right now, of course, uh, from 0.25% to 2.25% uh, to 2.5%, uh, still very low historic from by historical standard. But if you think about in nominal terms, it's a five times increase in interest rates in a very short period of time. The shocks could be quite significant if it goes to 5% or 6%, uh, uh, then it would be completely you know, unsustainable for many countries to, uh, to borrow new uh, 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 capital and also service their existing debt. And debt service payments, again, for the reason that I explained before, still as a percent of GDP is uh, very low, but it can change uh, quite quickly. And one of the things that different from 1980s and now in 1980s, most of the currencies were pegged to the US dollar. It had pros and cons because real exchange rate uh, became overvalued and affected ultimately uh, at the export competitiveness of these countries. But right now, most of the exchange rates are a uh, uh, flexible exchange rate and massive depreciation pressures are rising. Argentine peso in the last, since COVID, uh, uh, lost 125% value. Other major uh, currencies, roughly about 25 to 30% uh, uh, depreciation. So very large. And that is, we have to keep in mind debt servicing, the revenues are collected in local currency and debt is servicing next to hard currencies, dollars. So when the currency depreciates by 25%, nominally debt servicing cost goes up by 25% because you are converting the, your domestic revenue into dollar and that puts a lot of pressure on the reserves. Reserves are now sufficient, but may not be there for too long. And we may have significant run on the, uh, on the reserves. And already many countries are facing uh, shortfall of, of, of dollar reserves, and they are borrowing at a very high rate, way higher than the Fed funds rate that we are seeing right now. So one caveat and one difference between what was in the 80s and what is now is that in, in the 80s, most of the debt, Latin American debt, was owed to the five largest American banks. The, the you know, banks, one advantage of that was that it was very easy to restructure and negotiate and restructure the debt. And the Brady deal that came about and was able to uh, negotiate and find with some haircut that was restructured. But right now, almost I would say about 60% of the debt is owed to the private creditors. These are bondholders. They are disparate. They are all over the world. Debt restructuring, if you look at Argentine experience over the last three or four debt restructuring they had, is extremely difficult with the collective action clauses and all the other uh, uh, sort of loopholes and all the difficulties. Debt restructuring is extremely difficult right now compared to debt restructuring that had in, in, in the 80s. And that would be significantly uh, challenging because many of the countries would need to restructure their debt to make sure that they don't get into default. So last few slides, the added factor that was not present in the 80s is the China factor for Latin America. There used to be a saying in the US or in Mexico that when U.S. sneezes, Mexico catches cold. Right now, if China sneezes, Latin America would catch a cold because the relationship between China and, and Latin America is very, very strong, the trade relation and investment relationship. And China's economy is slowing down significantly uh, uh, for a number of factors. And if you look at right now, the, the China is the major, major consumer or, or importer of the major exports from Latin America, which are commodities. And commodity exports can be very uh, you know, uh, volatile because if there's a shock in the US, Chinese exports to the US to, uh, uh, go down and that would reduce the demand for Chinese demand for Latin American commodities. And that volatility would affect 
uh, the good prospects for, for Latin America. And all the major economists in Latin America, they have very high dependence. Uh, over 30% of their exports are uh, uh, going to China right now. And if you look at 1% decline in Chinese growth, how it affects the countries uh, in Latin America and major economies, some of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, the effect is even 2% or, or, or less in some cases. In case of Peru, I see 1% uh, decline in Chinese growth can be uh, roughly translated to 1% negative growth uh, in, in, in Peru. So a very strong correlation between growth in China and growth in Latin America. And China's growth slowdown is inevitable. First of all, China has become a large economy right now, and it cannot grow at 8%. Uh, and 9% rate that it, it, it averaged in the, in, in, uh, before the global financial crisis, even after the global financial crisis. China was driving accounting for about one quarter of global growth, but China's growth is slowing down significantly and it will be a trend. China's growth by some estimations can average about 2% to 3% in the next decade. And if that happens, Latin America has to brace for that, that reality. And part of the, the slowdown is coming from rebalancing of the Chinese economy. China was very export oriented. Now they're trying to promote more domestic or, or, or consumption driven and service driven economy. So that means they will not have so much of export to the US or Europe. They will try to build the economy from within and that would have reduced China demand for uh, uh, Chinese uh, commodities from, from Africa and Latin America. Uh, trade tensions, we discussed that a little bit before. Population aging is a factor in China that would also have a huge impact uh, 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 on, on, on um, uh, growth in China and also growth in, rest of the, in Latin America. And finally, the, this, if China slows down, commodity prices will have a... So if Latin America is bracing or hoping for another commodity boom, that may not come. So you have to think about economic policies without a commodity boom. So now this is my last three slides uh, and it's uh, hopefully I'm not taking too long. Uh, 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 wrapping up. So the question is that can Latin America avoid yet another lost decade? Yes, it's possible, but it would require a significant rethinking of policy options and learning from the mistakes of the past and also learning from the mistakes that we had or learning from the policy responses in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so in, in the advanced economies. If you look at this, there has been a paradigm shift since the global financial crisis, how Fed responded to the crisis and how the, uh, the US avoided a catastrophic uh, economic meltdown, both after the global financial crisis and also after COVID. Uh, one of the responses of the innovations was what is quantitative easing. That means that Fed started buying massive amount of government securities with the expectation that that would stimulate economic growth. We talked about it, that didn't stimulate economic growth enough, but that created an asset uh, price inflation in the US, which benefited some, but not everyone. And if you look at the US inequality has been rising significantly since global financial crisis, partly because QE definitely favored asset price uh, increases. But one of the interesting things about QE was that there's no inflation. And so basically the, it really challenged that the long held view that public spending, increases in public spending uh, inevitably leads to higher inflation. We didn't see that for, for a long period of time. Inflation that came after COVID was not because of Fed, Fed buying uh, securities, but rather supply side rigidities. Demand picked up very quickly after economies started opening up, but the supply didn't pick up as fast. Stickiness on the supply side was a, as a major factor. The formula that Fed uh, pursued, the policy uh, formula worked very well for the US but it had huge negative externalities for the rest of the world. And one of the negative externalities was that money flew out of the US, came to the developing countries. Some of them were long-term investment, which is good. Some of them were portfolio investments, short-term volatile capital flows. And that volatile capital flow basically increased the public borrowing uh, significantly in many of the countries and had some significant uh, uh, negative effect on, on long-term growth prospects. Fed repeated the policies in COVID time, which stabilized the financial markets, basically uh, made sure there's no collapse, no stock market crash of, of like the 2008 or stock market crash of even earlier times in 1986 or 1929. So financial stability definitely was uh, ensured uh, with this uh, new QE policy. And there was a massive fiscal spending that was supported by QE, which Fed 
became the lender of the last resort to the US government, US Treasury. Uh, US Treasury was not buying, uh, uh, borrowing directly from the Fed, but indirectly from the Fed, because Fed was buying the, any excess liqu liquidity that, uh, that the financial market was swapping the liquidity with the Fed. Uh, and that was a mechanism that worked. But Fed obviously underestimated the supply side constraints. And the monetary tightening in the US right now is definitely use, use, helping the US economy, but it's hurting the rest of the world. Because as I said, there's a capital outflow right now from developing countries back to the US and advanced economies. And also, you know, uh, debt servicing cost is rising very fast. So the, this is the main uh, uh, message that, uh, that I, I have is that it doesn't have to be that way. Like, you know, the, the lesson that we learned from QE is that it's possible under certain conditions and certain constraints that public spending can go up, even when the interest rates are going up, still it's possible to support the fiscal side. But fiscal and monetary side have to work together to provide the necessary support, necessary stimulus uh, to, for economic recovery. Right now, the, the biggest debate in the US is in high inflation. But if you look at the paradoxical uh, policy response in the US, Fed is raising interest rates. At the same time, this week, uh, at the Congress passed a bill called Inflation Reduction Act, which basically pumping about $600 billion into the US economy. That is paradoxical because if you're really worried about inflation, uh, the traditional response would be cutting back spending, public spending, where public spending supposedly uh, uh, is inflationary, especially in times like this, but it's not the case in the US. The US is able to do both. So, and this is a new framework of coordination because the, we didn't have enough economic research to show that, but it, it is probably likely that when a government borrows from the capital market and capital market then swaps that additional uh, and uh, the assets that they buy uh, from the central bank, swaps it with the, with the central bank, then it is less inflationary than government asking the central bank to finance the deficit directly. So this is an area of research that would be encouraged. Uh, uh, some research are on, ongoing right now, meaning that some public spending can be less inflationary than others public spending. And this is where the future of research, macro research is going. And this is where, uh, even with the strong dollar right now, because of the, all the factors that are playing in, higher interest rates, uh, capital coming back to the US, you see a very strong dollar right now. All the other currencies are, are, are depreciating vis-a-vis -vis dollar. And, but there's no concern about the strong dollar being very strong. Dollar strong is uh, it's not hurting the US as much, because US exports, imports become very cheap. But sorry, but, but then the, it is hurting the rest of the world. So. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my last slide. So I had an interruption right before my last slide. Okay. So coming back to the question that is it possible to avoid it, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a kind of long drawn economic recession in this region and also to some extent other parts of the world? Yes, it's possible, but it will require a completely new policy approach and it will require two sort of uh, directions. One is that to manage the externalities of the Fed policies, when Fed raises interest rates, often the central banks immediately follow in developing countries, they also raise interest rates. But it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there can be other intermediate approaches I can talk about during the Q&A that central banks can do. So always raising interest rates is not the, always the best option. Even if Fed raise the problem of arbitrage can emerge from that, but there are options. Some of the central banks are doing it right. So, but keeping an eye on the Fed policy is extremely important. And also, countries will need to brace for a completely different China. China slowing and down significantly, and that would be a strategic uh, direction for many of the countries, especially in Latin America, to keep in mind that you cannot rely on a commodity boom to uh, to uh, fuel future economic growth. And this is probably the most punchline of my presentation is that do what the advanced economists do, not what they say or preach. Uh, uh, it's, uh, often the, there's a disconnect between what they tell you to do and what they actually do. So uh, in the in case of the US, of course, US is a unique economy being the dollar is 
third currency economy, they have a lot of advantages that other countries don't have. But not everyone has to be a reserve currency, but still you can emulate some of the policies that Fed has and can have the same kind of uh, uh, benefits or same kind of uh, uh, sort of stabilizing effect on the economy and supporting economic growth. And fiscal spending has to be supported. There'll be a lot of pressure right now to cut spending because given the high inflation, but look at the example of the US, look at the example of in Europe, no one is cutting spending except for the, some of the developing countries they're cutting spending at the worst possible time because they are fearful that if public spending uh, is not uh, contained uh, and there are names for it, uh, fiscal consolidation, fiscal austerity, uh, fiscal adjustment, they're all the same thing, basically cutting spending, cutting spending at the worst moment in time. Fiscal rules can play a very important role, but at this time, austerity would be very unproductive or counterproductive. And basically finding more evidence for borrowing in the domestic market. It's very critical. Some of the countries have borrowed domestically. The US, US government, the treasury borrows most of its money from the social security fund and other long-term funds. And these are the opportunities for borrowing, but of course you have to also care, be careful about excessive borrowing and reckless borrowing can also create uh, problems in the future. Uh, the pension funds can go bankrupt. So there has to be a, a careful balancing. And also, it has this opportunity for restructuring some of the domestic debt. And last point is that, uh, two last point, there has to be more effective exchange rate management, meaning that when the exchange rates are allowed to free fall in a situation like this, when the debt servicing uh, would proportionally increase, there's an extreme need for managing your exchange rates. It's not going back to the peg, because that would not solve the problem. But intervening in the foreign exchange market in, in a way that stabilizes or keeps the exchange rate uh, at a stable uh, within a within a band is very critical, so that debt servicing burden become doesn't become unsustainable. And the final point is that countries often wait for for the debt default to begin restructuring discussions. That is too late, too little, too late. When the countries default, they are already in a in in, in in a very big disadvantage. They can't negotiate. So the way to do it is that. This, starting the discussion of restructuring way before the default. So this is a time to initiate that restructuring before there's a default. There's a, this, that distress right now for sure for many of the countries. And if the default can be avoided with a, with a preemptive restructuring, that's the ultimate or optimal option for many countries. Without that kind of intervention early on, many of the countries will face the default. And once the default takes place, it takes a long time to regain access to the capital market. If you look at some of the defaults that happened during the COVID time, namely Lebanon and Zambia, this and Sri Lanka recently, they're all negotiating the restructuring and nothing has happened. Zambia defaulted in December 2020. They're still negotiating the restructuring deal with the IMF and with the other creditors. So it's better to do it early on as opposed to wait until, the, until it's too late. I'll end here and then um, we'll probably come back to the Q&A. Thank you. No he escuchado bien, me toca. Yes. Ok. Muchas gracias por la invitación a primero a la asociación, la asociación peruana de economía, a la universidad, eh, a la OPC, eh, a Guillermo Hoppen, que fue mi alumno en la, en la católica, igualmente a a Jorge, a, a, perdón, a Carlos Adriancén, que también estuvo en la Católica, eh, y a la presidenta, este, a Claudia Sicoli, por la invitación a este importante evento. Y este, voy a hacer mi comentario en español, eh, eh, profesor Rashid, I'm sorry, I, I would be more precise in Spanish the, to comment your eh, amazing presentation. Uh, su presentación ha sido muy buena. Eh, eh, no creo que sea fácil eh, hacer una presentación sobre la economía global. 
en una situación tan turbulenta como la que estamos viviendo hoy. Eh, y mis comentarios van a ir a pedirle un poco más de ampliación sobre algunos temas. Eh, voy a tocar dos temas, los temas que me parece que están ausentes de su presentación y que creo que son importantes, y los temas que la presentación invita a reflexionar sobre ello. Bueno, eh, un tema que está ausente de la presentación es los efectos distributivos de esta eh, turbulencia económica. Hay este, muchos países, muchos sectores en los países que están siendo muy afectados por esta turbulencia, sobre todo por el incremento de la inflación. Es decir, los sectores más pobres tienden a tener menores posibilidades de gasto. Entonces, este es un tema que hay que incorporar porque eh, el, el impacto distributivo eh, por regiones y dentro de los países, también por sectores económicos, ha de ser muy importante y lo que no sabemos es si al volver, y ojalá que fuera así, el crecimiento económico o la estabilización y el crecimiento económico, esta desigualdad pueda eh, volver a retomarse para ir la... De, eh, disminuyendo. El problema es que la desigualdad está muy vinculado con la pobreza y entonces esta crisis tan in, in, eh, inusual porque ha generado eh, o tiene orígenes absolutamente distintos eh, y entonces eh, hace que la, la crisis misma sea difícil de, de interpretar y mucho más difícil poder, poder salir en un mundo globalizado. Ese es un primer tema. El segundo tema que me parece que habría que incorporar, y ahí creo que este, el profesor Paul Krugman tiene razón, es el tema del de calentamiento global. El calentamiento global tiene, ha de tener mucho que ver con esta crisis, sobre todo porque el, el calentamiento global se está mezclando con la, el tema de la guerra de Ucrania y con el incremento de los costos de la energía. Y esto probablemente lleve a volver al carbón, volver a sistemas, este, probablemente de manera pasajera, pero a sistemas que son muy contaminantes. Eh, en fin, este es, este es un tema que creo que hace... No, siempre pensamos que lo, lo del corto plazo y quizás lo mediano es lo más importante. Sin embargo, el tema climático es un tema que no debemos... de, de de descartar porque todo lo que se haga en términos de política eh, monetaria y fiscal y que tenga efectos sobre la inversión y sobre el consumo ha de tener efectos este, climáticos. Bueno, estas son las cosas que me parece que habrían que incorporar. Pero y eh, en los otros temas que, que me parecen que aparecen muy claramente de la presentación del profesor Tashid es qué factores se pueden manejar y qué factores no se pueden manejar este, por los países. Eh, en primer lugar, hay un tema de los factores eh, sanitarios. El COVID es una, digamos, se ha convertido en una especie de variable exógena y el COVID ha sido <coughs> enfrentado de maneras distintas y el problema, por ejemplo, que tenemos con China es que China quiere evitar de todas maneras que el COVID entre a, al, al país y por eso es que para la economía y entonces tiene los efectos que se han señalado en la conferencia. Ese es un primer tema, o sea, el COVID que, que sigue con nosotros y que tiene efectos eh, económicos ya sobre, sobre, sobre los sanitarios. El segundo tema es el tema geopolítico, que está bien este, presentado en la, digamos, controversia Estados Unidos-China, pero que el tema geopolítico incluye a Rusia eh, y incluye a esta tensión entre Oriente y Occidente sobre la primacía mundial, y esto tiene obviamente este, determinantes distintos a los de la economía. El, el tema, por ejemplo, del la, el gasto en armamento hoy que debe estar activando parte de las economías que están en disputa, es un tema eh, que tiene efecto económico, es decir, la, la, en general las economías de guerra tienden al, al, al pleno empleo. Entonces, hay este tema geopolítico que creo que es importante a tomar en cuenta y eso no se puede manejar sino en, en la 
arena de las relaciones entre países. Eh, y luego, eh, el tema eh, más político, el, 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 el tema político que es, es este, eh, curiosamente, es un, un, un tema que no afecta inmediatamente, pero sí tiene este, repercusiones. ¿A qué me refiero? Estados Unidos está ya por empezar al próximo año una campaña para cambiar al gobierno. Entonces es un sistema democrático en el cual cambios en el gobierno pueden hacer que hayan cambios en las políticas. China no. China y Rusia tienen a dos, este, yo diría, autócratas que no se van a mover. En consecuencia, su capacidad de decisión política y de política económica son mucho más estables que la de los países de Occidente, Estados Unidos y Europa que en la conferencia no se la ha mencionado, pero Europa es un, un factor importante también en términos de la política y de la geopolítica, y sobre todo en el tema, y aquí ya voy a, a, aterrizando y quizás terminando, en el tema eh, que tiene que ver con la coordinación de políticas. Eh, hay un tema eh, que es importante, eh, que es la coordinación de políticas monetarias y este es un tema que viene desde la época, desde hace mucho tiempo, yo recuerdo al profesor Stiglitz hablando cuando la crisis asiática sobre la importancia de, 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 de tener un banco central mundial cosa que no hay, pero lo que reemplaza es el, digamos, la coordinación entre bancas centrales y entre países y claro, la banca central europea debería coordinar con la, con la FED es decir debería haber una especie de, de coordinación que no siempre es posible porque cada país tiene una política monetaria en función de las eh, eh, metas eh, económicas de su país. Además, hay que ver que las políticas fiscales de cada país también tienen que ver con este tema. Entonces, este, ya para ir este, terminando, porque claro, yo no tengo... De, 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 el papel de hacer una, una nueva presentación, sino simplemente de, de fomentar la, el, la, la discusión y el, el, el debate sobre este tema. Este, en, sa, en, la última, eh, eh, en la última filmina que presentó el profesor, que me parece muy interesante, este, debe, necesitamos una nueva, un nuevo paradigma macroeconómico. Ese es un tema... <coughs> que tiene que ver no solamente con la política, sino con los académicos. Y entonces, perdón, se presenta esta, esta cuestión curiosa, que es tasas de interés altas y política fiscal expansiva. Yo recuerdo hace 15, más de 15 años, cuando el profesor Rudiger Dornbusch estuvo en la Universidad Católica, nos dijo que esa combinación es para los magos. Entonces, eh, uno eh, comienza a decir, bueno, en general estas son dos cosas contradictorias para salir, pero esta, esta combinación de tasas de interés altas para frenar el consumo y mayor gasto público para que, que no haya recesión, entonces el resultado puede ser bastante impredecible. <ríe> y finalmente, quisiera este, preguntarle al profesor allí en, su, en sus investigaciones, porque él ve pues todo el mundo, nosotros desde un país pequeño como el Perú vemos que a nosotros nos va a afectar porque nosotros somos exportadores de materias primas y si el mundo de, eh, el del norte comienza a, a tener eh, tasas más bajas de crecimiento nos van a, a, a importar menos productos. Entonces yo lo que quería este eh, Pre preguntarle a, a, al, al, al profesor Rashid es en qué medida va a ser más importante la salida de la, la bajada de inflación de Estados Unidos, el incremento de su tasa de crecimiento que está baja por el momento versus lo que ha de suceder en China. China nos ha explicado bien que tiene que ha cambiado de modelo, o sea, el modelo totalmente exportador se está convirtiendo en un modelo eh, 
digamos, dirigido al mercado interno y ese modelo dirigido al mercado interno ha de necesitar de más materias primas, más este, energía, etcétera, y eso va a tener efectos sobre nosotros. Pero claro, el tema es, este, estamos frente a una, un mundo de incertidumbre. Sabemos qué es lo que pasa con la incertidumbre, pero el asunto es que no sabemos cómo acometer los problemas que se han presentado, que se están presentando eh, y que, que eh, el profesor eh, Rashid nos ha eh, hecho una muy buena presentación. Muchas gracias. Ok, Yeah. 
and they won't probably generate commodity boom. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're not that the share of other economies in the United States, but uh, in order to defeat the characteristics, uh, policymakers should focus to improve the inequality that they need to avoid some the external, external shocks like uh, the policy of China and the war between Ukraine and Russia. It seems that nobody wants a new uh, logic. <laughs> you know, so um, thank you for the question and thank you, Professor Gonzalez, for uh, your comments. Unfortunately, my Spanish is not good at all or non-existent, so I wish I knew Spanish, but uh, I apologize for that. Maybe I should uh, take Spanish to understand Latin America better, you know, so. Uh, my understanding of Latin America is mostly through literature, uh, for full, full disclosure. Uh, magic realism, that's what I uh, read about in Latin America, you know, so, but coming back to economics, um, there are a couple of questions that I want to answer, and also your question, uh, uh, Professor Dean. Um, so, China's slowdown, of course, uh, is is, uh, is something that uh, we have to uh, Latin America has to uh, take into account, and there's no silver bullet. And you know, obviously, uh, Latin America has heard this message over and over again from international experts that. Latin America has to diversify. Economic diversification is much harder said than done. Uh, it, it requires a lot of efforts to diversify. Uh, diversi like when an economy is dependent on one or two major commodities, it's like addiction. Uh, and breaking an addiction is not easy. Even countries that are very successful in this region, namely Chile, Chile has been trying to reduce its dependence on copper for the longest period of time. With only limited success, Chile diversified exports of um, uh, you know, wine, exports of uh, salmon, and other non-copper commodities. Still, they account for less than 30% of Ch uh, Chilean export. So diversification is not easy, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need to start or doesn't, there should not be any efforts. So if the goal is to diversify, uh, but then where do you start? Uh, there's extensive literature in economics, uh, which is coming back to, to right now to, to mainstream economics, uh, the uh, literature on industrial policy. Uh, back about 10 years ago, if you mentioned industrial policy to a mainstream economist, you'd be looked down upon. People would say, oh, industrial policy, this is a very socialist idea, uh, very much of an idea that is not market driven. But you have to sort of reboot your thinking in economics. You can call it whatever you want, industrial policy or macro policy or development policy. But now the most advanced economies in the world, they're embracing industrial policy. US now is using, officially using the term industrial policy as it is trying to rebuild its capacity for microchips production. Uh, semiconductors, which is basically the liquid gold that would drive global economic growth in, 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 in you know, decades to come. So Latin America needs industrial policies, uh, uh, you know, revisit the industrial policies uh, framework that it had in the past. Previous industrial policy was all about import substitution, that you 
prevent all imports, raise huge trade barriers, create infant industries, and they will uh, grow. Ultimately, they will become adults. But experience within uh, with those kind of industry policies that you don't see infant growing into adult. Infant remains an infant forever. And that is a real challenge for countries where you, I'm not a believer that you can have industrial policy and handouts to certain sectors of the economy so that they would prosper on their own. You need a combination of domestic competition and international competition. If you take away international competition, you create white elephants. And there are examples of that within the region and across regions. But Latin America can learn a lot from East Asian economies. And, and uh, Professor Dean, uh, he mentioned that, you know, the per capita income gap between Latin America and, 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 and Eastern, uh, East Asian economies. If you go to the 1950, Korea was an impoverished backward country. Korea's per capita income was about $500 when Latin America's per capita income averaged about $3,000 or even more. Korea did something very right. And what can you learn from Korean uh, experience? And this is where the industrial policy needs to marry education policy and fiscal and monetary policy. You cannot do industrial policy in isolation. What the Koreans were asking in the 1950s, what can we produce now given our competitive advantage? I'm sure all of you learned competitive advantage in, in international trade. And they realized that their competitive advantage lied in low skill labor intensive uh, manufacturing, namely clothing. But Korea said, but if we start clothing now, how do we transition from clothing to the next phase? And that's where the education policy came in because they realized they can't go into building aircrafts overnight. They have to start somewhere at a very low skill level. So they started manufacturing with a staggered approach, clothing manufacturing and said, okay, in 10 years time, we want to basically build the machineries that are used in the clothing factories, in, in garments factories, I meaning the sewing machine, the ironing machine, all these things we'll build ourselves. We'll not import it from Japan. So, but then they asked the question, what kind of education we need, skill set we need to go there? Then they started targeting schools and academic institutions. Okay, these are the skills that we need. But in Latin America or, or rest of the world, in Africa, and also from the region that I come from, there's no connection between industrial policy objectives and education policies. And then by 1970s, Korea was saying that we want to go to shipbuilding. And everyone was laughing at Korea. Korea is the number one shipbuilder in the world right now. A country that doesn't have any steel, no iron ore, but they're the largest shipbuilder in the world. How did they make it? But they realized in the 60s, they have to go to an intermediate skill uh, uh, sector where they can demand higher skills, but also they would have labor intensity. They didn't want high unemployment because if they, you go to straight to high skills, then only you can find a few people to work in those high skills. Shipbuilding was an intermediate choice. It demanded some degree of skills, but still it was labor intensive. And that helped Korea to catapult to the next stage of manufacturing technology, like you know, Samsung of the world didn't come from nowhere. It was a gradual phase, education policy and industrial policy objectives going hand in hand, supported by fiscal and monetary policies. That didn't happen in Latin America. That didn't happen in South Asia, in India, or in Bangladesh, where I, I am from. It didn't happen. Another example is, if you look at Germany, an advanced economy, does it have industrial policy? Absolutely. What it does, every few years, German manufacturers are asked, what kind of skills you need to become global, to remain globally competitive? And the small businesses, all of them, they put their wish, wait, uh, wish list to the local government. That these are the skills that we need. Precision technology. We need to have people who can measure things very well. Uh, we need people who can do this kind of experiments. And then the G G German federal government and the state governments direct resources to build those skills. So this is an educational institution. And we have to ask your professor like what skills we're learning today are relevant today, but will that be relevant 10 years down the road? So longer term planning with skills matching the demand in future is critical. For, for Latin America to reduce its dependence on commodities and reducing dependence on 
on China, it has to have a longer term perspective, 30 years, 40 year perspective. This is where the country, countries need to go. And how do we get there? And education policy has to be part of that important mix. And without that, we would have a lot of talks and I can come back 10 years time and we'll be still talking about industrial policy and nothing changing. And, uh, and, and uh, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, what happened in Latin America in the last 10 years when there was a huge commodity boom, but the revenues that came with that commodity boom when not fully utilized or most optimally utilized to support massive improvements uh, in education system. If you look at China right now, China's universities are now competing with the American universities. And Almost all jobs are becoming non-local, especially jobs that are service sector jobs, which are the most of the jobs are in the service sector. So this is where you have to pay a lot of attention uh, in terms of somehow it hasn't taken off. Uh, in 1950, Venezuela was the richest country in the Western Hemisphere after Canada. Canada had the highest per capita. Uh, and now, now look at Venezuela. Look at Argentina in 1900. Argentina was the richest country in the entire world. Uh, and uh, what has happened to it? And these are all missed opportunities for the entire region because a lot of bad policies uh, uh, at play. Uh, if you can repeat your question uh, in the back, so I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't have my pen to take note. Yeah. Okay, so I think I partly answered that, you know, a, a good synergy between macroeconomic policies and sectoral macro, macroeconomic policies, including educational policies, would be very important. And the macro side, I, I would want to emphasize another uh, point is that if you look at experiences with between fiscal and monetary, two major policy uh, uh, in the macro side, many of the Latin American countries were following advice it received from international organizations, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, and to a lesser extent, my organization, the United Nations. And often we were, international advisors were giving advice that you need strong policy independence for the central bank. Central bank should be independent. They should not be taking instructions from the ministries of finance. And that advice was taken too literally. What the policies meant, advice meant at that time is that central banks need operational independence, not policy independence. Central banks are not political entities they would still need to be guided by the policy imperatives and policy imperatives are the national policies of development goals or growth objectives. But then once a government decides what kind of growth it wants, whether it's a pro poor growth, whether it's a inflation reducing growth, whatever it is that central bank should be left alone to choose between different policy options, whether it should uh, uh, focus on the interest rates, whether it should focus on the reserve requirements, it has a, a set of options that it can choose from. But in Latin America, what you saw over the last 40 or 50 
limit. And the joke of Bank of Korea was, in this when Korea was growing very fast for the last, uh, you know, uh, you know, between 1950s until about 2000, Korea Bank of Korea they said it used to be a branch of the Ministry of Finance, uh, and basically Ministry of Finance would tell us what they wanted, and how we got there it was out left to us. So they were not independent central banks per se, independent central bank. They were, but here the fear was that there's a risk of populism, right? You know, uh, political government comes and they say, look, we want to do this, we want to do that. But Korea, unfortunately, didn't have that populist pressure. They were looking at longer term economic goals, objectives. So setting those long term goals are very important. And then let the technocrats, the, the like central banks are technocratic institution and let them decide how they want to uh, achieve, help government achieve that goal. But they should not have separate policy goals of uh, independent of the ministers of finance. So that coordination, and I alluded that uh, to a, a bit, uh, for example, right now, many central banks are worried about exchange rate uh, management. The, the countries are facing their exchange rates are depreciating very quickly. And what can they do? in a situation like this. Often they want to use the reserve to support the exchange rate. And then there's a pressure. No, 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 don't use the reserve. Reserves are very important. We have to enter the reserve. But reserves to what end? And reserves must be used if needed to support your exchange rate. Because exchange rate, when it has a free fall, it makes your debt unsustainable. So you have to make sure that uh, that kind of support is uh, there. Another uh, Latin asset in many central banks, which is the US has, again, QE, I, I'm going back to QE, that Commercial banks deposit their How is How was QE financed? A lot of people think that QE was financed uh, through printing money. No, Fed was not printing money. Fed doesn't have the authority to print money. What Fed did was swapping. So you buy, you are a commercial bank, so JP Morgan, you buy some government uh, securities, US treasury bills, but you don't want to hold it on your balance sheet for too long. You wanted to have it for some diversification purpose, for some other purposes. Then you go to the central bank, say, look, I want to put it on your balance sheet and but you, in, in return, you give my reserve back. So it's a swap operation, swapping. So reserves are used to buy the government security. Central commercial bank reserves are used to buy government security and supporting government spending. So that kind of innovation, that kind of creative policy coordination can play a very important role. So I know some of them are, may sound a little technical or not exactly what you do in undergraduate, uh, as read in undergraduate school uh, uh, economics. But there are many, many tools available to a central bank and to the Ministry of Finance if they're used effectively, and they can actually support many objectives. But in, in this region, often they are not utilized very effectively. Partly because, I would say partly because region also put a lot of faith in international advice as opposed to international learning. Uh, uh, there could be tremendous of learning opportunities, learning spillover from East Asian experience. One last comment I would make is that there was a study from us. I, I saw someone who was from Center for Global Development, Nancy Bertzol, who was the president for uh, CGD for a long time. She did a study in the 90s that how inequality mattered in the growth the, uh, uh, trajectory of Latin America and East Europe, Eastern, Eastern Asia and countries, namely Korea, Malaysia, and, and Taiwan and others. And she found a very interesting trend that low level of inequality Initial low level of inequality in East Asia played a very important role. What happened in, 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 in Brazil versus in, in Korea, Brazil's inequality is much higher than inequality in Korea. So high level of inequality discouraged investment in education. If you're a poor household, extra dollar that you have, you make a choice, rational choice between, can I spend that money on education or can I spend that money on buying food? If you know that inequality is so high by finishing uh, like secondary schooling, there'll be no change in your economic prospect. 
So they don't make the marginal investments in Latin America in education. Whereas in Korea, given the low inequality, many Korean families fe felt, if I put some additional money in education for my children, they'll be able to overcome the barrier. They will be at the next level of income. They'll be at the higher level of income. So there was an expectation that there's a positive return to education, investment in education. In Latin America, uh, Nancy Bertzel's paper, I don't remember the paper's uh, title, showed that in Latin America, there was no real expectation that investment in education pays off. Unless you come from a very wealthy family, you are already endowed, you have all the connection, education will give you the privilege to remain at that at the level that you are in. But extra investment in education at the lowest income of households will not put you uh, uh, in a higher trajectory or, or let you uh, climb the social ladder. So there's less incentive for investment in education. If I have to explain, the, uh, this was probably the most convincing argument that I found why Latin America lagged compared to East Asia, uh, while the East Asia was much poorer uh, very early on. So I think that's one of the factors that, that, that I would look at, the investment in education. And how you can create incentives for investments in education. And one of the students I was talking to, I was asking about the tuition uh, uh, cost in this university, uh, just to understand uh, how uh, accessible this education is. You know? uh, and obviously, it is an expensive private university, but again, there are mechanisms to make it accessible to all. You know, there are some interesting mechanisms as well. I'll stop here if it's okay. That's right. Again, thank you very much for.